I'm here with Rob Eistat. Rob, how are you? It's so good to see you. Good to see you too, Frank. What a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You're so kind. Oh, I miss you. <laughs> so we're recording this on Wednesday, June 3rd. I'm in New York City. Rob, you're in Long Beach, California. Is that right? Yeah. And how are things there? It's been a, such a difficult week. It's been such a challenge and it's, um, it's very sad for all of us. Long Beach, um, we had 3,000 people protest and we had a number of, of my favorite restaurants and businesses looted and burned. And um, but what's, what's lovely about Long Beach, people uh, really care about our community and we all got up the next morning and cleaned everything up. And oh. it was cleaned up in like three hours. There were that really? many people that came out, yeah. Which was really heartwarming. And the majority of the people that cleaned up were the folks that were protesting. Ah, right. Well, that's really meaningful. They never intended for that to happen. Mm, that's encouraging. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later about, um, you know, COVID and the effect on that on all musicians. But uh, let's talk a little bit about you and then uh, your association with BCI. Um, for uh, listeners today who haven't worked with you before. Can you give us a little bit of a, a brief bio, how you got into music as a profession, um, number one, and number two, conducting specific? So. Well, I'll tell you, Frank, uh, my grandfather was a professional violinist, and uh, he had to turn down a chair in the first violin section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to go fight for our country in the South Pacific during World War II. And when he returned home, obviously um, that position wasn't available to him and he had to start a roofing company. And uh, I promise this all leads to something. And he has all, he loved classical music. He loved opera and, um, and he saw that I was really interested in it. And he's the one that really um, engendered my interest and cultivated my, my, my training as a pianist. And, um, he, he rarely played the piano for us because, or played the violin for us because his fingers, he said his fingers were so big, you know, and they'd been injured roofing all those years. Mm. And every Christmas he would, he would play and I would, I would play with him and it was a really special time. So mm. I went to college as a, um, as a pre-med major with a piano scholarship. Huh. Because I went to a small private Lutheran school, you know, Scandinavian Lutheran down in um, Rock Island, Illinois. And they forced me to join the choir, Frank. It was terrible. I was so angry. <laughs> I, I thought, I don't sing, you know, and I complain and complain. And finally, you know, the director of the school just finally said, listen, young man, you will sing in the choir. And, uh, and that was the, the first day of the rest of my life, as people say. I, I walked into that space and I just fell in love with it. I, I couldn't believe the magic that was happening in that room. I played in orchestras my whole life. I was a percussionist and I, I played piano in orchestras, but there was something so different about singing that touched my soul. And I'll never forget, I called my father and said, dad, I think I'm gonna become a musician and possibly a conductor. And I was very worried, but he's always been supportive. And he said, can you make money? And I said, yes, I think I could make money. I don't think I'm gonna be a very, very wealthy person, but..." I think I will be wealthy in spirit and in, in uh, friendship and love. And so uh, that's what happened. And I just kept following doors that opened. I and, um, had the for fortune to meet some amazing teachers in my life. Mm. Still with me. So. And, and how did you make your way out to California? How long have you been uh, from Rock Island to California? I, uh, that's a funny story. I was auditioning to... Um, complete a master's degree somewhere. And I looked at all the places you go, Cincinnati Conservatory and Westminster Choir College. I was very interested in studying with Craig Hella Johnson, who at that time was at UT Austin. I applied, um, where else did I apply? Madison. And then my teacher said, you need to apply to study with John Alexander. And I thought, well, I know John as the professional conductor. I didn't realize that he had a university program and he worked at this little school called Cal State Fullerton. And so I, I, you know, you do what your teacher says. I applied to Cal State Fullerton. And it turns out um, my, 
my favorite audition experiences were at Cal State Fullerton and with Craig at UT Austin. And um, the best, well, the saddest day was when Craig called me to tell me he was taking over Chanticleer. And so he would be leaving UT Austin and wouldn't be teaching at all. And it was a great day because my decision was made for me. And I, I moved to California, never expecting to stay. I, I completed my master's with John and, and got to work a little bit with Pacific Corral and then uh, completed a doctorate with my teacher, Bill Denning at USC in Southern California. I really wanted to work with him and, and applied for jobs all over the country and the crazy people at Cal State Fullerton hired me, which some of them were my former teachers, which was, it has been such an interesting joy actually to work with those people yes. and a challenge. And then the crazy people at Pacific Corral named me a finalist for that job and uh, never, ever expected to, to have the opportunity to be with them. And it's, it's really a dream. So now you are working with the Pacific Corral and also teaching at Cal State Fullerton. And many of our choristers will remember quite fondly working with you at, uh, both at Sonoma and Cal State. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, um, teaching at school, uh, I'm, you know, once classes shut down and we all had to transition to teaching online, who knew, I've started teaching solfege online, who knew such a thing existed? Um, but how did this work? I mean, clearly you can't do ensembles online. Um, so talk a little bit about that. I think you'd be very proud of us, Frank, because we turned our ensembles into musicianship factories. Oh. Uh, and all of and uh, technique factories for the instrumental side and so that was actually really beneficial um helping them individually with their with their solfege and with their uh, ear training which i think is invaluable luckily we train all of our students to use tuning forks hmm. from the very moment they stop step on campus primarily um first of all i think it's really important to bring the body and, and everything into alignment that way with uh harmonic lattice as opposed to a piano. But, um, and a lot of our students are impoverished. They can't afford keyboards and pianos. So this tuning fork was really sort of their gateway into being successful this semester. So the ensembles, uh, we did put together a virtual choir, which isn't real choir, but uh, it was a project for us. And, and the people in, in our TV station on campus helped us because there's no way I could have been able to figure out I mean, I shouldn't say that. I probably could have, but I didn't have the time, Frank. I don't know about you. Yes. Well, the time, and certainly I don't currently have the knowledge, uh, but, you know, we're all figuring things out. Um, and I've got a ton of equipment now. <laughs> right, and I wish I had bought stock in Zoom, you know. <laughs> and Netflix, actually. Um, right? But, Netflix, but not Disney. Now I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Oh yeah. I'll yeah. tell you that um, that uh, conducting classes were interesting. My graduate conducting lessons actually improved. The students conducting in silence, and I made them sing and jump all over the staff and sing the parts, and that that taught me a lot about ways I could be more effective once we get back together in person. Mm. My undergraduate conducting classes that that was very difficult for them. Yeah. So building those oral skills and they're still building that that sense of connection to music in that very deep um, mental way you know they don't have uh, they're, they're building those skills and so that was tough but uh, can you talk a little bit more about the graduate conducting class so um, how did that work you would uh, choose a particular piece and clearly you talked about it um, and you can still do some technical things with them conducting but as far as hearing the music, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Primarily, uh, again, they were using their tuning forks and some of them had keyboards, but we, we did a lot of work with recitative, which was helpful. They had to sing, you know, I always make them sing recitative, but they had to sing everything and move with their own hands. And I asked them to, to prepare each recit in at least four to five different ways. Uh -huh. so that we had lots of different ideas about how it could go. The other thing is, is when they were conducting in silence, I could tell whether they were really listening or not inside their head, whether they had a real oral image in their head. And um, 
often made them sing. So I would say, okay, I want you to now sing the oboe line for two bars, jump down, sing the violin line for a couple bars, jump up, sing the horn line, you know, at the pitch in the real, you know, and so it was a struggle for them at first, but putting all that together actually improved their technique. How, so they, you know, I think a lot of people who are not uh, trained as musicians or certainly those who are not uh, conductors don't quite understand how one can look at a full score and deal with all of those different instruments, let alone hear what's going on and, you know, on which instrument do I focus when, you know. So this strikes me as a really good exercise. Um, it was really helpful. I was very proud of that because every single person bravely jumped in. And I think it helped that we were all struggling, you know, with this new online teaching world that yeah. we all gave each other a lot of grace through the process. And um, I was just pleased to see their improvement. Their, and um, and I, I will ask them to do those same things in person when I see them the next yeah. time. Yeah, right. And, and what a wonderful outgrowth of, of the situation we find ourselves in, yeah. Uh, so uh, BCI, you first conducted for us, I think it was 2016 in Sonoma County, Israel and Egypt. And then a few years after that in Fullerton, where you did the Durfle Requiem and uh, Mozart Coronation Mass, I think it was. So can you talk a little bit about uh, your memory of your, you know, first time at BCI? And, you know, you don't know what you're expecting. Uh, it's a group that's never met together before. Any, any particular memories stand out for you? Uh, there? Well, honestly, I did, you know, you're encapsulating my thoughts because I, I, show, I was nervous. You know, I showed up and I thought, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen here. I, I had never served as, as an apprentice um, or a faculty member before. And I, I called some of my friends that have, that have conducted. They said, you're going to love it. You're absolutely going to love it. But just realize that, you know, you have to build these bridges. And um, when I showed up, there was no bridge to be built because the people just embraced one another and me right away. I, I guess I hadn't realized that people come every year and that they have these beautiful relationships that they cultivate with each other. And um, my favorite memories um, are both musical and non-musical. The meals that we shared together were really fun. And um, I learned a lot, you know, BCI, the folks that, that come to BCI are so beautifully um, informed. They're well educated um, with these amazing stories, life stories and experiences. And I think I, I learned a lot about life that first year and a lot about myself. Um, my favorite musical memory, I think, was the first time we got into that gorgeous green center on campus. It's in Sonoma County, yeah. Oh my goodness! It's like a, it's like a, uh, it's not a carbon copy, but it's sort of based on the hall in Tanglewood, and um, just, just looking at it was was astounding. But then the sound of that choir in there, with that beautiful symphony, um, and the amazing soloists that you, I met, I met some of my dearest friends that year who are who were your soloists, who I have uh, actually hired to be with me in uh, Orange County with the symphony and the chorale here because they're just first class, some of the best singers in the world. But I'll never forget, um, there's that moment in Israel and Egypt uh, where the, where the uh, talking about sort of the angel of death sort of creeping in uh, to, the, um, to the Israelites space and to the Egyptians and it's just very foreboding but beautiful chains of suspensions. And uh, I remember it just ringing in that, in that gorgeous hall. And beautiful concert hall. And in fact, we were scheduled to go into Ozawa Hall at Tanglewood this yeah. summer, uh, carbon copy. And of course, that's not to be. And fingers crossed for the future. It will happen in the future. We just have to keep saying that. That's right. That's right. And um, do I remember correctly that when you did the Durafle, uh, that was your first time conducting the full orchestra version? Or? I had only conducted uh, the chamber orchestra version with, uh, you know, the horn, the trumpets and uh, the harp and, and some strings. What a privilege. I, every organization that, I shouldn't say this, but every organization, tr you know, tries to figure out how to do things in a way that will save, save a little money. And so they're like, well, why don't we just use the chamber orchestration? So conducting that big orchestration for the first time was life-changing. My goodness. 
what an experience for all of us. Yes, and you know, I think this is one of the reasons our uh, choristers so enjoy BCI and come back year after year because they get the opportunity to do a full orchestra version of the Dürfle, uh, for example, which they may not get to do at home. Yeah. And you hired this fantastic orchestra. I'm looking around at my friends saying, wait, these are my friends that play in the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the Pacific Symphony. We went from Dürfle and I, I prepared the Pacific Chorale to sing at the Hollywood Bowl with the LA Phil, I think two weeks later. It was like, half of the same orchestra sitting on the stage of the Hollywood Bowl. So this is the caliber of, of, of orchestral musician that BCI brings in. And I mean, how many people have the opportunity to be with the, that kind of, of artistic talent? Well, we're so glad to offer the opportunity for you and our singers. You know, it, it makes such a difference when you're with uh, uh, an orchestra of such high caliber, caliber and also a uh, conductor you know, for the whole experience, faculty, soloists, uh, everyone. Um, I want to get back to the idea of meeting a group for the first time, such as BCI, Chorus. Not only you are meeting them for the first time, but they are meeting as a group for the first time. Many have come back year after year, but this particular chorus has never been together before, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a group that you work with on a consistent basis, whether it's at school or the Pacific Chorale. Um, how you might approach it differently? Are your expectations different? Is your preparation different? That sort of thing. I would hope that my preparation would be the same, that I would be as, you know, as, as um, committed to excellence in music as possible. But I think building that community during that first rehearsal is essential. I think it's essential to bring the focus of the group together. Um, I really tried and, and Hope, I think I did an okay job bringing, bringing together this sense of um, shared responsibility and joy, the fact that we could all sort of get off autopilot. I really like when I get, when I get with a new group, when I, when I become friends with, with a new ensemble, um, I really like them to be in the moment with me. And so I start with, and you may remember that, but I start with some exercises I learned from, from my friend Chris that, that, um, really connects people in the moment, avoiding static patterns, changing things, using lots of kinesthetic energy, giving everybody the opportunity to sing, to open themselves up in a very safe and exuberant space um, without, you know, before we even start rehearsing the piece. And, and one of the things that I so enjoyed about that is that you include the chorus and the process. It's not just the conductor getting up there and saying, do it this way because I said so. <laughs> I often tell my students, you know, the reason we're doing this is not just because I said so, which in itself is a good reason, but we have other reasons for doing this. And, and you absolutely showed um, the community aspect of what uh, a chorus is about and also the collaboration between conductor and singer, you know, conductors have to react to what they hear in the moment and not just their idea of the way a piece should go. But I do love this idea of transferring some of the conductor-centered um, technique to the ensemble. I think creating that sense of shared responsibility and asking for input is, is essential to building not only rapport, but, but a, a, a shared dedication to to the highest artistic level and I, I've had to learn how to do that you have to let go you know I've sure. had, um, and it's 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 definitely interesting when I when I look at, at a choir and say well how could we make this better yeah well you know in that regard and this is related to my last question or previous question I mean um, is there a difference in the way you approach the different strata of musician, and by that I mean volunteers, uh, music students, uh, professionals, uh, uh, groups with which you work. I would say, I would hope that I approach them all with the same artistic fervor, but I do change the nomenclature, the way I talk about things. Can you give me some examples? Um, I guess I would say that uh, when I'm in front of a student orchestra, I have to help them a little bit more understand articulation and I have to 
to, to sort of challenge the way that they approach playing a specific phrase. As opposed to working with a professional orchestra, uh, if there's an articulation problem, I just work with the concertmaster to figure out whether it's a bowing problem or something. You know, they, they can make a change in a moment. They just, you know, want that that check and that downbeat and that intense artistic experience. I would say it's the same, you know, at Pacific Chorale, I have a 24 voice profession, fully professional chamber choir. And then the Pacific Chorale is this amazing mix of very talented volunteers and a core of 32 staff singers. Mm -hmm. And I, I often will, will treat those, those ensembles slightly differently just in the way that I explain it. I find that I have to offer a little bit more vocal technique instruction uh, when I'm working with the, the big, huge symphonic chorus, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I, I would, I kind of avoid telling my professional singers how to, how to sing. <laughs> that never works too well. <laughs> Keep them. <laughs> you know, it never works too well. And the other thing is, um, sometimes our volunteer singers who are just so talented and so experienced, haven't had the latest training in Baroque performing practice. Right, and so I, I find it I find it refreshing and fun to to give them this kernel of knowledge and watch them take hold of it and and work through it, and I would expect my staff singer to be up on on that information and to be doing that in the moment. Does right. that answer? Oh yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, again, for our, our choristers who um, have not studied music on an ongoing way and certainly uh, uh, may not have been studying conducting. Can you talk a little bit about how you uh, learn a new piece or perhaps revisit uh, pieces that you've done before and a little bit about your process? Do you go for the text first? Do you look at the music first? Do you sit down at the piano? You had your singers uh, you know, singing various parts. Uh, sorry, you had your conducting students singing various parts. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, what your process is? First of all, the composer was inspired to write the piece because of the text, if we're talking about choral music. Right. So I usually like to start there, and I, I go back to Mrs. Haugen's ninth grade English class, and I, I actually complete an analysis of the poetry, if it's, if it's a poem. If it's a, if it's a text from a sacred book, I really try to, first of all, understand the context um, in, in the faith process in the in the faith tradition just because i want to respect it regardless of of the of that um regardless of, of the faith practice and so i try to do that analysis i really do enjoy sitting down at the piano and just plowing through one time just to see kind of the language i i like to kind of wrap my ears around the harmonic language but i'm a big um, music theory nerd a big surprise i mean i'm a pianist and i love teaching ear training and i love theory and and so um i i do a fully nerd nerd alert a full functional analysis <laughs> of the piece me too. <laughs> i do it helps me hear it better it, it just helps me sort of take all that information i always tell people that you know i'm sitting here i'm teaching um monteverdi vespers right now and i i i say this is not music that that's my first class you know, this is not music. This is a representation, you know, in this is a representation in print of somebody's imagination, mm. musical message. And so it's my job to translate that into something magical for myself so that then we can do the work together as an ensemble to create that same, that same experience. So yeah, whatever it takes. So then I, I do my analysis. I sing a lot. It drives my partner crazy. You know, I sing the various um, instrumental lines, especially especially if they're uh, melodic lines and, and not foundational. And I usually analyze the instrumental parts first, and then I go to the choral parts mm -hmm. afterwards. And I don't know why I do that. I just find that a lot of times the the clues the clues to the the nugget of of um, genius in the piece start in the instrumental parts. And I, I really just stare at it and sing it and tear it apart. I pull it apart in little tiny parts and phrases because if I can take it apart for myself, I can then help other people understand it. And you know, there's no magic. It just takes a lot of hard work and hours and hours and hours of study, you know, like anything else. But I love it. It's a isn't that a luxury? I think about the people in the world 
that that don't get to struggle with a piece like that that don't have the opportunity to come to bci and and in a week tear apart this amazing foundational masterpiece and actually perform it themselves we can go to an art museum and we can see these things but we can't get in a time machine like in music and you can't recreate this these amazing works of art and experience it from the inside exactly you know yeah uh um a conductor friend of mine said when he was younger he learned how to play the viola as it were first of all he wanted to get work <laughs> <laughs> but also, he knew that he might want to conduct someday, and he wanted to experience an orchestra from the inside first, you know. And the same thing, you know, it's one thing to go and listen to Brahms, which we all love to do, but to experience Brahms in the midst of a chorus, in the midst of an orchestra, uh, and, and create those sounds is really unlike anything else. I miss it, Frank. I think all of us miss it. You know, we can't wait to get back to it. So speaking of which, um, you know, none of us really knows where we're going uh, with all of this, but do you have any thoughts about um, oh, where and when you think uh, things might open up? Uh, actually, perhaps uh, things are opening up in California in a way that they may not be in other parts of the country. Certainly New York City is still uh, fairly locked down. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in, in Los Angeles, we're very much like, we haven't had the devastation with COVID that New York has, especially New York City, but we, we have a high number of cases and it keeps going up and, and deaths as well. Mm -hmm. And so they actually, they're opening up LA County, but in a very slow way, we're not allowed to get big groups of people together. They canceled our Hollywood Bowl season for the first time in 100 years. Mm -hmm. And um, and most of the arts organizations will be can I saw the Metropolitan Opera canceled uh, their fall. We're all really anticipating a, a real opening, I think, in spring. This gradual sort of flowering of, of live performances again. I think that we will be able to get some people together very limited number to sing in an, in an empty hall, in our concert hall and video and maybe do a live stream or, or do some videoing. And we'll only do that safely. So we're, we're actually working with the city and we're working with health experts to figure out how can you do that safely so that we don't injure people um, or, or endanger them. Yes, of course. Right. There's always a risk anytime. There's a risk I could fall off the podium, you know? And so, so that, I don't want to equate that to COVID. But one no. thing I have done is I've programmed, I don't know how many concerts, Frank. I think I've got like 12 concerts now <laughs> that have been programmed and they could, they're modular. So they could, they could be moved just about to any location. They could be done on a variety of instrumentations or maybe even a cappella. And so I have all of these different options that when things start opening, which I believe they will, we could start rehearsing and performing in you know in a variety of different ways yeah and you know i was talking with one of our conductors tom hall recently who put it i think very well and he said somebody will come up with an idea you know there is an idea out there it just hasn't been thought of yet and it hasn't been put into practice which will help who knew that we would be teaching on zoom for example you know so it's out there and i think it's too important for all of us uh this idea of uh, a communal activity, not just the act of singing, but being together, uh, making music as one is such an important part of, of what singers do. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, even at the university, I was just at a meeting uh, before this at the university, we're talking about getting the choir on campus in groups of less than 10, so probably eight, in the parking garages. Huh. See, the president is talking about okaying the, the closing of some of the parking structures because we will be virtual in the fall, except for athletics, arts, and lab sciences. There'll be some ex, um, exceptions. And with Pacific Corral, too, we're talking about could we rehearse in a parking structure? Great ventilation. Yes. And acoustics. You could take cones and, and we can, you know, we can uh, delineate. Lots of space, where they're saying 12 space, twelve feet of space per singer between singers. You can make an analogy between your crescendo going up the ramp to the second level. 
and <laughs> take or intonation coming down the ramp. You know, you have to take smaller steps. That's and, and let's just hope that our singing doesn't cause those, you know, those annoying alarms that go on and on and on and on. And on. <laughs> That's right. Rob, it was great to see you and great to talk with you. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who are listening, we're going to transition to a question and answer period, uh, which will begin shortly. Thank you so much.